Hey everybody out there, my name is Dragnix, and today I set my critical eye upon Goofy Space Adventures in Galaxy of Pen and Paper. It comes out to Steam, GOG, The Humble Store, along with Android and iOS on July 27th, 2017 for $14.99. It's a turn-based RPG with a more light-hearted and humorous nature to it but it keeps things relatively simple in the gameplay department. It's developed and produced by Behold Studios, known for their work on Knights and Pen and Paper Plus One Edition and Chroma Squad. So, can this new setting and slight alterations to the presentation and gameplay help Galaxy of Pen and Paper carve a new journey into your gameplay library? That's what I'm here to find out. But before I begin this review, this key was obtained from the developer for the purposes of review. That won't change my opinion of the game in the end, but you should know that because of FTC guidelines, as well as the whole morals thing, you know? Let me get this out of the way for those who have played Knights of Pen and Paper. Galaxy of Pen and Paper is pretty much in line with the humor and gameplay of the Knights version, just with a space setting, except in one area which I will get to at the end of this review. If you don't want to wait around, skip to this timestamp. Now you may ask why I'm not just saying it now, and well, you'll see in a little bit. So here's the basics of Galaxy of Pen and Paper. You and your friends are holding a nice little role-playing session as you create your GM and two characters to start your journey into the unknowns of space. My GM for my farthest playthrough was of course, the boss. Sasha Banks, which was an automatic custom pick when I saw the pink glasses she iconically wears in one of the item slots. From there, you create two playable characters from a mix of different races, attributes, and classes surrounding four main stats, power, body, mind, and senses. From there, the game plays as a simple RPG. You get a main line of quests that you go on to move the main story along, in addition with the ability to take side quests to earn extra experience, credits, and reputation for your crew. Now you do have exploration elements in the game to find things like weapon upgrades and the ability to scan for items and resources and to fight in space dogfights. But I want to emphasize from the get-go here that the game is simple. Do not expect complicated RPG systems. Do not expect 40 hours of gameplay here because it's labeled an RPG. But all that doesn't mean that the game isn't worth your time or doesn't have its own charm, because it definitely does. The biggest draw of Galaxy of Pen and Paper is its story and humorous use of gaming and sci-fi's past to get a laugh or two out of you. Much like its predecessors there, it's clear that the developers are hardcore nerds at their core, using items popularized in such games as Mega Man and anime such as Dragon Ball with some more niche references in planet names such as Echo, which holds, you guessed it, a race of dolphins. It's one thing to use references, however. It's another to use them well, and I think Galaxy pulls it off. It knows enough how to play out the tropes of a sci-fi genre and what you'd expect out of a story, but pull it in several different ways so that you aren't bored from an onslaught of nostalgia. It's done with tact setting up jokes whether it be via juxtaposition or through sheer creativity of the reference made. This is something that I see a lot of smaller indies usually struggle with when it comes to references. They throw them in without really thinking about what they're doing or what they're saying. Not so here. It feels like every joke used was carefully crafted and not just jammed down your throat. It also helps that the game takes those moments to remind you of its universe by backing out of the role-playing session and seeing the characters who are role-playing. It uses real-world themes such as online trolls to establish plot points and integrate them within the RPG's evolving story as well. This is all done with its humor in mind. Even with the game supposedly getting serious at certain points, it never really does. It's hard to do that when you have a literal flying spaghetti monster as one of the bosses, but it's still an effective story nonetheless. 
This really comes into play in the main storyline and non-procedurally generated quests and gameplay, like the locations that you happen to come across while exploring and talking to citizens. Sadly though, the world building when it comes to the aforementioned side quests don't do well at all. It's clear the quest you're making is just in a framework. Heck, at times, it can make no sense given the character and what he or she is asking you to do, even if it's in their own style and request system. It negatively compares against the careful crafting of the other parts of the story, feeling so disjointed that you basically want to avoid them altogether. Let's move on to the gameplay at this point. A majority of the action is done in combat, where you will face off in a turn-based system, with four possible techniques you can use your SP points for. Each class has a specific strength, of course, whether it be tanking damage from the enemy team, creating threat to draw the attacks from other hostiles, or focusing on critical damage strikes that disable defenses. Now, each character may only have four skilled slots, but there are around 16 to 20 that can go into those, so you do have a reasonable choice on how you design your characters, which can make a huge difference in battle, especially with the shield system. Shields in this game act as a secondary health bar before taking your HP, and recharge a bit as soon as the character's round starts. That's typical in the FPS genre, of course, but it ends up working well here due to its design elements and skill specifically targeting and avoiding the shield as a whole. A set of enemies with fastly recharging shields will be hard to take down from a pure damage perspective, for example. But if you poison them, you'll notice that those shields don't really make a difference. That's where the game does its best. The different status and strategic elements of battle, where the battle lines are pretty even on both sides, and it's clear you have to use your wits and team design to defeat your enemies. The game throws a bit of different scenarios at you. Lots of enemies at once, giant overpowered enemies, physical enemies, status inducing ones. Sure, you can try to make a team that is multi-purpose and is flexible enough to deal with every situation, but you really won't get the most out of your team's skills in that case, mostly due to the inherent combo design built into this game's system design. A good amount of these skills have qualifiers to make the characters really benefit from them. For example, you may get a bounty hunter who heals off a poisoned enemy, but doesn't really have a lot of good ways to poison himself. But a nice med tech could really complement him being able to poison multiple enemies at once. Those combo skills can be really effective in completely destroying the enemies in front of you. Almost too much, in fact. See, one of the biggest problems I have with Galaxy of Pen and Paper is its skills relative power and balance issues. Let's take the chemical reaction skill for example. It allows me to deal poison status on an enemy and heal 59 to 72 of my character's HP. If the enemy is already poisoned, then it only deals 24 to 49, but also heals 59 to 72 for my entire party, all for 5 SP. Now, you may think that sounds overpowered, and to be fair, it is a useful skill. But by itself, it's got some reasonable costs. It only poisons one enemy who can easily resist it on their turn for a good amount of SP cost. And considering the character I put it on, he may need the heal instead of actually working for this sort of benefit, because I may need that heal right now to somebody else on my team. So it does sort of balance out a little bit keyword little. But then let's look at Epidemi, and yes that's what it's called. It does 43 to 52 damage to my target and applies confusion to that target meaning they can hit other enemies. Okay fine, then it applies poison to every single adjacent enemy. Now you need to understand the enemies here are sorted into a 3x2 grid. That means most likely you have at least one enemy, if not two, if not three, that are always adjacent to each other, which means you've inflicted three to four statuses at once at times, along with damage, and the possibility of healing strongly next round if you so happen to have the chemical reaction skill I mentioned before. When I compare that skill to other skills that my character can have, 
it just doesn't compare. Sure, it took the most amount of level up skill points to get that skill, but even those in the same skill tier of it don't compare. There's literally no reason for me to take it out of my lineup. It does too much damage and benefit for what is relatively a low cost. And considering that my guy had an easy way of recovering SP thanks to another skill, yeah, the difficulty of the game was definitely in my favor here. I really wish this was an isolated case here, but there's three or four combinations of skills like this that turn the game into a walk in the park. It also doesn't help that about halfway through the game, the game starts running out of tricks. Specifically, you start getting the same battle over and over again. These guys, for example, which go from one guy that you may have trouble with on your first boss battle to two and then to three, and really the battles, while they can be difficult at times, don't necessarily play out that differently when it comes to your skill selection and the strategy you go about defeating them in. I think that's what bothers me the most about Galaxy here. I think if left to stew for a little bit, with proper adjustments to the combo skills and a lot more play testing, that this game could be very, very solid for a beginner RPG while still allowing veterans of the genre to really enjoy themselves as well. Very similar to Knights of Pen and Paper. I almost want to say that this game is a couple of months early on the schedule, which will come up later in this review. Trust me. As for outside of combat, there's not much to tell here. Scanning is basic and really only serves to get you more items or credits without really testing you on anything. And the space combat is too simple for my taste. I like the idea of rolling for hits and all, and on the surface it works as a slight counter to the combat system, but it also barely evolves as the game goes on. Sure, you get missiles and you get the ability to create more shields in this scenario, but the base gameplay doesn't really change strategy-wise do more damage to the enemy, and that's about it. Which leads me to something that is more subjective in terms of my analysis of the game. The game's charm. Even with the balance issues in question, the game has a way of making you overlook it thanks to the comical story and the obvious love of video games as a whole. The artwork, for example. It has a pixel-like style that isn't necessarily bad or good. It's somewhere in the middle. It's got defining elements to it, but I've seen a lot better from other indie studios. And yet, I can't pitch the game without this specific style, because it feels right for the type of game that's being put forward here. Now yes, did I want more assets overall when it came to this presentation? Yeah, I did. There were times that assets were reused, specifically underground bunker rooms, that got a bit old. Character models don't seem to have that problem if it's a new character, but characters come back way too often for my tastes. I'm looking at you, Ginormous. In addition, the music in certain cases is surprisingly good, and is something that really should be highlighted about this game. Now, I say surprisingly here mostly due to the fact that the game is also going to be on the mobile platforms, and you don't normally see the money put into this element of those types of games. But this soundtrack, especially one of the first battle themes you hear, is something you can't help but listen to and smile about over and over again. Take a listen to hear what I'm talking about. Finally, we come to the biggest problem that the game has. 
the one that makes a final verdict very difficult to render considering, the bugs. Now, I'm not talking about small glitches here, things that make text wonky or do some strange things from time to time. Those exist here, of course, but I'm talking about the game altering ones, where a quest doesn't work because something has gone wrong on the other side of the fence. And well, a lot worse than that. You've probably been wondering this throughout the video. You've probably noticed at times that I have four characters on the bottom of the screen but there's five characters on my side of the battlefield. Now you may have guessed that some NPCs join you to help out in your quest, but you've also probably noticed that this guy right here seems to be a constant in my party. Well, here's the thing. He's someone who I was supposed to escort from one planet to another in a side quest. In that quest, something went wrong and I was unable to complete it as the prompt never showed to turn in that next part of the quest. So I just abandoned it and created a new quest. And he stayed. And his presence actually affected gameplay because enemies would actually attack him. And right now in this current state, he can absorb pretty much all damage and statuses. So if they did attack him randomly even though he had a low threat, well it was basically a missed shot for the enemy. In fact, at a certain point in my adventures, he was the only one alive on the field when a boss was poisoned, and I think that prolonged the battle until the poison ran out, because I didn't get a game over screen until the poison went away. Yes, I almost won, with none of my real party alive. However, then there were times the game completely broke. My first run ended when I got a screen where I couldn't do anything move my party, or even turn in a quest, or go off the planet. Okay, fine, I'll just reload and hope it's fixed. Except that no, that seemed to not help anything. In fact, I got this screen now. I sent in bug reports, of course, but I was like, fine, I'll start again, it should be easy to get back to this point, even if I don't do any side quests. And then it happened again in my next playthrough even when staying out of the side quest portions that seem to be buggy. But these kinds of issues happening when you couldn't recover from them? Yeah, that's a major problem. They are aware of the issues via the bug reports I sent in, but I'm going to be honest here. I can't fully recommend a game in this state, even if I enjoyed the lead up to it. And even if these particular bugs are fixed, with all the other bugs I saw, I don't know if it will be truly fixed by the time this game goes live. It doesn't help that I'm recording this on July 25th, 2017, and the game's supposed to come out on July 27th, 2017, and the game looks like this for me right now. I can't play it. There's absolutely nothing I can click on other than that button on the top left that you see there, and this is supposed to be the title screen. So the game is in this state at this point, how can I recommend it even if they fix the bugs before launch? So the way that I'm going to handle it is like this. Every day I'm going to check to see if the game is fixed from a perspective of bugs, and I'm going to do my best to update with another video that comes out on this channel saying that, hey, this game is fixed. And I will link that video in the description below. And I will try to use the card system, even though the annotation system would have been a perfect use for this here. Thanks, YouTube, for that. Thanks for taking that away. But when those bugs are fixed, is the game worth a $15 purchase? <sighs> I want to say yes for certain people. If you are a story-driven person, if you are a person who wants to see charm in their game, a lot of good references, things like that, then yes, I think for RPG fans, sci-fi fans, this game is for you. There's enough to the gameplay to keep you entertained at least in the first half of the game, and you'll really appreciate where they take the story. Now, for those who are so focused on gameplay though, yeah, this game is not going to do it for you, especially at that halfway point. The game falls off a cliff in terms of difficulty, it really actually suits itself in terms of the mobile platform for a game that you can pick up, get some fun references out of, and have enough gameplay to keep you entertained for little bits at a time. Now, if you're going to sit down and play this game all the way through in terms of one session, 
no, I don't think the game is going to keep you entertained at least that much. And as always, if you have any specific questions about the game, leave them in the comment section below. I will do my best to answer any questions so that you guys have all the information to make a consumer decision on this game. Coming up next on the channel will be a review of Blaster Master Zero. I did just get a Switch and I wanted to review a game for it so I could become accustomed to its controls, accustomed to the mobility of it, and just understand exactly what the system's strengths are. And I played Blaster Master, the original, a lot as a kid. I love that game. So seeing Blaster Master Zero, perfect. It seems like the perfect game for me. In addition, that video will have a second video right after it saying the results of the giveaway for the last Overwatch Friday and what videos I will be focusing on over the next two months based on your guys' feedback. Anyway, if you did like this content, there's only one thing I ask of you. Leave a comment in the comment section below. I'm not going to ask you to like the video. I'm not going to ask you to subscribe. Yes, I'd like that, but you know what? The more important stuff is getting that feedback, what worked in terms of this video, what didn't work, so I can refine it so that I can make better review videos for you guys. So if you have that feedback, leave it in the comment section below and I can become a better creator and hopefully get more subscribers, hopefully get more people looking at these videos. Anyway, this is Dragnik signing out and as always, keep on gaming.